Yeah, we played in San Diego for the first time last year, and it was just magic, man. It's, you could definitely tell that people enjoyed the music, and we're actually going back there again in May uh, to play our own show, not not at the House of Blues, but at another venue. And our management told us the other day that we've sold quite a few tickets for that show. It's our own little headline show, so um, amazing. Yeah, it's it's, it, it's a promising, you know, with this whole American thing. It's it's exciting for the band to be you know, getting over to the States and, and making waves. So. Hey, what's up, Joel? How are you, man? Good, man. How's it going? I'm fantastic. I appreciate yes. you doing this. Thank you so much. No worries, man. No worries. Whereabouts are you in the world? Uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Working, bro. Yeah. You're in New Zealand? Yeah, man. Oh, yep. man. It must be early there. What, like 9.30-ish? Yeah, yeah. 9.30 in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to make you get up this early. No, you're right, bro. I've been up. I've been up been for a run, so it's all good. Oh, right on. Uh, well, uh, I, I, my name's Adam, and I appreciate you doing this. Yeah, sure, man. Cool. Um, well, this podcast is about you and uh, your journey in music, and we'll talk about the album you have coming out. I, what is it? Next week? Next Friday? Or next Friday? Friday from now? Yeah. Wild yeah, man. man. Very yeah, very cool. Fun. The sixth Thanks. one, right? The, Six albums? Yeah, six, sixth album that the band's recorded, and um, we've spent a couple of years recording this one, and um, it's been yeah, it's been quite a fun process. We've definitely taken our time on this one. We we usually record an album a year, but we decided that uh, it's time to take a bit of a break and and spend a bit more time, um, oh. you know, on the on the road as well. We, we were quite busy touring last year as well, so it's just balancing the life of you know being on the road as well as being in the studio. so mm -hmm. Yeah, that's wild. I mean, to put an album out every year and then have all of them <laughs> go platinum thus far or multiple times platinum, that's yeah. a pretty huge uh, feat. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. Yeah. Um, well, first off, what part? Uh, are you born and raised in New Zealand and what part? Yeah, so in, I'm in the North Island, a uh, place called the Bay of Plenty, which is on the, uh, the east coast of, of the North Island beautiful beach town um close to um close to auckland which is the main city that people fly into it's two hours south of auckland and um yeah it's a beautiful beautiful place to live born and bred here and uh lived lived overseas a bit but basically basically stayed here most of my life yeah nice and what about as far as music goes do you come from a musical household creative household at all yeah, for sure. My dad started me off when I was a was a kid on the ukulele. Um, oh, cool! Playing, yeah, playing playing the ukulele from uh, he got it from the rubbish dump, and he put some like fishing line string on it for me, and that was my first little <laughs> my first <laughs> instrument. Really? So it was able yeah. to be tuned and everything with fishing line? No, nah, it was just uh, uh, it was just like just two years old playing this. Oh, yeah, okay. just playing out of strum. <laughs> There's this classic video of me playing Old MacDonald you know, like strumming along in time. And I think that was, that was the, uh, my dad was like, oh, the kid's got rhythm, you know? So kind of took off from there and he got my first proper guitar when I was like, yeah, four. And then, uh, oh my gosh. Still so young. I have a seven-year-old and I can't think of like three years ago, him picking up a guitar. Yeah. Yeah. So dad was a singer as well. So we, we did a lot of singing together too. So yeah, that's where it all came from. Was he in a band or anything or is it just, um, no, so but he he was a country musician, so he played a lot of um, he he played rhythm guitar and backing vocals for a lot of different people, but um, never did it as like a professional career. But yeah. Oh, so he must be stoked that you, that you know he handed you the uke at two, the guitar at four, and now you're doing this. You yeah, know, for so, sure. So many records, and you know the the success you have built uh, with with music is insane. Yeah, you know, for sure. I, I was, um, unfortunately, my dad, he passed away when I was in my early 20s. So he never got to oh, see, man. he never got to see this whole journey, which is a bit of a shame. But, um, sorry, man, that's awful. No, it's, that's all good. And, and, you know, it's just a part of life. And, uh, he, he was definitely the guy that gave me the, the tools to, to get where I am. And, um, super grateful for that, you know, and super grateful to be, uh, able to make a living out of this thing. And I know he'd be super proud. So, yeah. 100%. Um, so, at, you know, before you get a guitar, and do you keep playing guitar throughout, you know, your teenage years and everything? Or uh, did you start a band? Like, what was kind of the, were you in the school band? I mean, where, where did you kind of head? Musically? Yeah, it was it was all over the place. I guess, I guess when I was like 12, I, I started 
um, playing in bands and, and bars and pubs and, and stuff like that. But before that, I was doing a lot of busking on the street. Oh, wow. Were you writing playing, your own songs or just playing cover songs? No, nah, just playing covers, yeah, just just playing guitar tunes and then started singing a bit more. And, um, yeah, and then when I was uh, in my teens, started my own band, you know, just doing all sorts of stuff. Um, and then I, when I was 18, I went to jazz school and studied music up in Auckland. Um, oh, wow. Studied jazz guitar for three years, which was really fun. Um, and, yeah, so I've always – always kind of uh been studying the instrument and and voice as well on the side and when the lab thing came along it was um yeah i was like 24 when when brad hit me up I was in my t- you know the 20s when uh when that all happened but before all LAB, lab i was i played in so many different bands and different projects and stuff like that and definitely uh started to get into more creative projects the older i got mm-hmm. i started to get you know more curious about songwriting and and uh, being creative on the instrument and um it was just so nice to meet uh you know that the stars aligned with meeting brad cora who's the drummer for lab and producer and you know me and him have had a, a creative kind of bond since we met you know we we started jamming together and writing songs together it's been, it's been a, a beautiful journey over the last seven or eight years so mm-hmm. yeah you were in a band prior with with a couple of the guys, right? That were that are in the band now. No, so I, I wasn't in, no. the, uh, in the band with the boys, but Brad and Stu, who are two brothers, were in a band together. And um, our bass player Ada, he was in a, a band called Catch a Fire. Oh, okay, we, yeah, I thought you were. Yeah. I thought you played with Catch a Fire as well. I got confused. No, nah, no. Nah, so we we've been the the uh, it's like a big family, you know, all these bands from New Zealand that are that are in that roots reggae kind of soul sound. That you know, we're all all a big family and when we first started with lab we um catch a fire took us under their wing in australia and we did our first kind of international tour wow we played, played like 20 shows in australia with them over a month and it was baptism by fire for sure <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Was, uh, did, did you have a bunch of songs out or or like was it just okay we know no, these guys was, and let's let's just hit the road yeah, because of this, uh, I guess um, Brad and Stu, because of their prior success um, with their band Cora that they had, mm-hmm. um, we kind of had an end to the industry, you know, and, and Catch a Fire could see the potential of, of what we were doing and were super supportive. And we at the time, we didn't have any, we didn't even have a song, we didn't even have an album. We were working on the first album, and that was back in 2016. So it was the band's kind of first, you know, proper tour. And it, it was, you know, it was an incredible experience. And thanks to Catch a Fire, uh, you know, for that opportunity, it was it was really um, it was really special. And now, you know, we now we play with Catch a Fire quite often on different lineups around around the country. And you know, they're doing great in the states as well. It's it's inspiring to see what Catch a Fire are doing in America. And mm-hmm. uh, hopefully, we follow in the footsteps of that. Cool. Yeah, I, I was born and raised in San Diego, and reggae is like was is such a big genre there. Yeah, in Southern California. I mean, I, Nashville now here. I mean, it it's became a big genre all, all over the world. But um, I feel like when I was there in Southern California, we had so many reggae artists come through. It was the, yeah. probably the biggest genre. I, I used to do terrestrial radio, and if you just started a radio station that was just Bob Marley, you'd be number one on the chart every single year. You know, a month. It was gotcha. crazy how much people love, yeah, loved it. Cool, man. That's um, yeah. We played in San Diego for the first time last year with um, with uh, Maori. He's a Hawaiian rig artist, and uh, we were opening for him. We played at the House of Blues, and it was just magic, man. It's you could definitely tell that people enjoyed the music, and we're actually going back there again in May uh, to play our own show. Not not at the House of Blues, but at another venue. And our management told us the other day that we've sold quite a few tickets for that show it's our own little headline show so um amazing yeah, it's, it's it's a promising you know with this whole american thing it's it's exciting for the band to be you know getting over to the states and, and making waves so, yeah was this your this will be your what for will it be your first headline tour of these states yeah well, we're doing a, a, a mix of things but we're doing some of our own headline shows mixed with some festivals and then opening for jay boog um, oh yeah i love yeah, jay so, boog i've had him on yeah, so doing a few shows with them as well. So it's a bit of a mix, but that's all in May. Very cool, man. That's awesome. 
Um, so tell me about putting out that first record. I mean, you had m success off the f the first album. I mean, Controller was a massive song, and the the whole record goes platinum. And I mean, to see that kind of right away was that. Pretty, I mean, talk about uh, you know, inspiring. I would imagine to keep going on. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was a, you know when I got the phone call to to join the band, um, it was in its early stages of you know, finding its feet for sure. Brad was trying to find the right team to to create a project and, and a band. And, um, you know, I was just, I was waiting for an opportunity like this to come up. And so I knew at the time, you know, when I met Brad that it was something special because I, I was a fan of the band that he had been in previously, a massive fan of Cora. And um, mm -hmm. um, so I knew the opportunity was the right opportunity to take. Um, and yeah, as soon as we, as soon as that album came out and started to see, I see it go off. It was it was surreal, man. You know, the, I never forget like the first shows we were doing where they were, the crowd was singing our songs back to us. You know, and it was like, wow, that was <laughs> that was a moment. Like we made it, we made it. <laughs> People like our songs, you know. Um, Dude, it was for just... sure. I mean, to to come in as the front, but I mean, the vocals and everything too. That was that like a, I mean, you knew Core was a successful band. You're a fan, and they're like, oh no, we want you to front the band. Was that yeah, a pretty it was it was cool, uh, nerve wracking, man. It was it was very. Um, I knew it was a big. Yeah, you know, it was going to be a big challenge. I knew that from day one. It was like this is this is all un, uncharted territory, you know. And um, that I was just ready for. I was ready for it, man. And I'm, I'm still to this day, you know. There's things that I that I find hard about it, but it's um, it's something that's become, you know, second nature. The more touring that we do and the more shows that we play and. I mean, we, we went from playing clubs for 400 people to playing, you know, a sold out show and like a couple of sold out shows in 2021, 22, which had like 20,000 people in the crowd, you know, so oh my God. it was like unbelievable, the the trajectory of like the band and how quickly it kind of happened um, mm -hmm. over, you know, some would say a short period of time, but it's been, you know, it has been eight years since, you know, I first met Brad and we started, um, you know, going down this this track, and it's um, it's yeah, it has been a lot of grinding. We you know we when we're not on the on the road, we're in, in the studio. When we're not in the studio, we're on the road, and it's just getting busier and busier with with touring now because of the world being back open and the opportunities coming left, right, and center. It's it's um, it's it's great to see. Yeah, and like you said, I mean, you started on an instrument at two years old and four a guitar, and then mm. you've studied the instrument your whole life. I mean. You've been grinding and working towards this, you know, since you were a little kid. It's not like that's right. You know, he asked you to be in this band, and then you guys just get massive right away. I mean, even eight years to build this is is a long time. But I mean, sure, you have the songs that are right in the fans, and to have every album platinum at least one time platinum is crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you feel like with the? Sorry, go ahead. I didn't. I didn't want to. All right. Yeah. Right. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I was just gonna say with the putting out Lab Two or Lab Two was that uh, were you guys worried at all like oh was this gonna land the same way the first one did like we had so much success with that first album do you got like yeah. any nervous sophomore album feelings yeah for sure and and it was it was that album that was the, the experimental album I feel of Lab when you look at the body of work over the last you know, six albums, it's the one that we were pushing boundaries and really trying to search for that sound of LAV, you know, and then, um, yeah, we came out with a bang for sure, that first album, and a lot of people, you know, that's that's their favourite LAV album, and then and then in the year comes out on the album three, which was the song that took the band to the next level and, and became mm -hmm. the biggest, you know, the biggest song of that year, and, and still to this day, I think it's one of the... You know, in the New Zealand charts, it's, it's been in there for like 180 weeks or 200 weeks or something. You know, it's just it's been in the top 40. So, um, so that that moment was like, okay, I feel like LAB's found this. You know, we've found our sound and we've, we're finding that that kind of, you know, that that signature flavor that people will fall in love with. You know, and and the songwriting from kind of album three onwards has been really fun. Um, because yeah, you're right. There was a lot of pressure on that second album because of the success of the first. And, um, it's not that the second album wasn't successful. There was definitely some songs that that went well on that album. But um, 
when, we, when I listen back to it, I can hear the band like going in certain directions and go, oh, let's try this style and let's try to see what we could do with this kind of, you know, this flavor. And um, mm -hmm. But now I would say it's more refined and more focused on certain sounds. And, and we just were adding in like the sixth album has got strings and horns and some beautiful kind of textures um, that are, you know, adding to uh, our songwriting kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it's fun, man. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. To come back. Well, yeah. In the air is massive. And then you even, uh, why, oh, why was a huge song. Yep. And, um, to have, you know, those moments, I'm sure that was like, wow. I mean, to have the song still charting, that's wild. Did you ever, uh, or did you, cause I know the cool, a really cool thing that New Zealand does, uh, when I had like Nick and famous on, uh, you can get like a grant for help with projects, right. In the, in the arts, I know Canada does that as well. Um, hmm. Have you guys ever taken advantage of that or even early on maybe with the first record? Oh, for sure. Yeah. New Zealand on air have been incredible for LAB. They've, they've been super supportive. And, and the first, I think the first three, maybe four albums we had um, help, you know, with grants from New Zealand on air to, to record those albums. So uh, yeah, it's, you know, the New Zealand music scenes, it's, it's massive, but it's, it's small at the same time. You know, we've got um, people doing incredible things overseas with, with the, you know, people like Lord and Crowded House from back in the day, and they're still going hard. And um, so we, you know, it's cool to see, um, you know, the country support the arts. I suppose it is, it's definitely a tough gig. You know, in a country this big, you know, there's only five thousand, five million people. It's, um, you know, you go to California, and what there's you know, 20, 26 million people. Yeah, I was gonna it's say like, there's like twelve yeah. million in LA alone. It's crazy. Yeah. So. Um, so, you know, we, we do get good support. And um, I guess the hard thing for, for Kiwi bands is that overseas thing and getting, you know, getting that momentum overseas. You, you have to constantly be touring or, you know, base yourselves in a place for a while. Some bands do that. You go and live in a Sydney for a while. They go live in Berlin or LA and and um, really, really focus on, you know, working with different producers and, and stuff like that and touring in those those territories. Yeah, I just I I've had a you know like I said a couple of artists from New Zealand on, but Canada as well are the two countries that I've heard that they do these really cool things with with grants and giving artists you know opportunities to make money or not to make money but to fund projects like an album or music yes. video or something like that. I yeah, you know I think it's such a rad thing that they they don't do here. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, um. So you said okay. I mean, you guys put out an album every year up to 2022 right or yeah and then you've then this new album's coming out next week um talk to me about you know the how when did you guys start this i know covid probably maybe rushed or, or not rushed but gave you a little more time to probably work on like the 2020 2021 albums i don't know but then going yes, into this yeah. album it sounds like you know you guys took some time on it or yeah, more time sure. so, not that you didn't take time on the other ones i know that. Up, <laughs> you know up, what i mean so, <laughs> yeah yeah so album four um album four and kind of part of album five were both kind of um covert albums i suppose we because we couldn't tour overseas hmm. we uh we definitely did a lot did a lot more studio work and i i think that's partly why we've managed to tune over so much material um put out so much content because of because of COVID, um, and just focusing on the studio stuff more than more than the live, because we couldn't get out and play live, you know. So, uh, but this this latest album, it was like you know, we wanted to get that balance of touring and and being in the studio, right? And it was the opportunities were coming in with international tours and getting to Europe and the states and and Hawaii and stuff like this. And it was like these are what the opportunities we've been waiting for, you know. These are the moments that the band need to um, invest in and, and pr prioritize, I guess. And because we had the four albums kind of four or five albums sitting there, you know, we, we thought, well, well, we'll take our time on the sixth one. And just when we feel we're in the place to be creative, then we will go into the studio. And it's just been nice to not have that pressure of like tuning another album out and, you know, like really focusing on each track and giving it the time of day and, not trying to get blood out of stone. Um, Cause I, I feel like it's not like we got to burn out, but we got to that place where it was like, I don't think I can be creative. I need to go fill my cup and, and be a bit more um, 
you know, self-absorbed for a while and then come back with a fresh perspective um, to be creative. So, yeah, we definitely gave ourselves the time and it's it's going to, I've got a good feeling about this next album because of that. I think we've really harnessed a cool energy, you know? Yeah. You said, uh, you know, the second album was more, you guys did a lot of experimenting on that album, yeah. but it sounds like with this new one, you guys are doing different things on it. You said you're talking about like strings and, and, uh, and other elements and other, you know, textures and stuff that you haven't used prior to that. Yeah. Like talk, talk to me about that a little bit. Yeah. So we, we started using horns a lot in the live set. We were, um the first couple of albums didn't have any horns or strings on it and uh i guess it was a money thing as well you know <laughs> couldn't afford to have have those things at that time but um i guess having that stuff's a little bit of a luxury um to a point so we we decided to bring in a a, a horn section for the live show and then that kind of morphed into bringing the horns into the studio and into the songwriting process um you know, would be sitting there writing ideas as the five of us, the core band, the core band, the core five of us, and kind of going, well, I can hear, I can hear a horn line there, you know, I can hear the strings kind of doing something. So we started bringing that in probably from album four onwards, album three, four onwards. Um, and then, yeah, it's been fun writing. Um, Louisa, who's a, who's our uh, sax player, she's on, um, she plays flute, alto, tenor, baritone, she's a weapon. Um, she's been working alongside us um, and an incredibly creative girl as well. She's just got cool yeah. ideas and, and her and Brad, Brad being a producer, you know, he knows how to get the best out of everybody. And I think it's been cool um, collaborating, you know, with her and she, she runs the horn section. She brings in the boys and bosses them around <laughs> the trombone and, and, the, and the trumpet. And they're incredible live, you know, like it's such a cool element on the live show. You bring a horn section out and it just has that power. It's like, wow, you know, Sure. It's been really fun recording more horns on this album and introducing, uh, you know, the flute and all sorts of stuff. Uh, so, yeah, the strings thing as well has, has been probably not as string heavy on this album. It's probably more in the horns and stuff, but the strings were a really fun thing to experiment with too, you know, with the ballads and you know, with the song controller off the first album. It's got no strings on it, but you could hear the potential of the band writing in that kind of ballad style. And, and since then, we've done a lot of ballads where we use strings and stuff like that, which is super fun. Yeah, you you said uh, the the this person came in and you know kind of bossing around the the horn players, but when it came to writing the songs, was it she kind of improvised on what you guys had put together? It was like, oh, it'd be cool to do this here for yeah, the horns. So it was kind of interesting because like we had songs that we we'd recorded and, and been playing live for so long. And then we're like, Hey, we should add, we should add some horns to this. So we gave her that kind of creative um, platform to, to do her own thing and, and put her twist on it. And then when it comes to writing in the studio, we, we probably have a bit more pull in regards to what we want from the horns and what we can hear. And then, and it's kind of a balancing act. She'll throw a few ideas into the mix and then Brad will be like, yeah, that's me. Play that again. And, kind of how it works um um in regards to the songs that have been around for four or five years and adding the horns to them has just added a whole new life to those songs and for us to play them live you know uh, it just takes it to another level so that's quite cool that is. but yeah in the studio brad basically produces and directs where the sound goes with with each song each idea okay and are you bringing the horn section on the road out here no, unfortunately not. Okay. Uh, I was gonna say that'd be a pretty hefty, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, yeah, situation to not only get everybody here, but to to tour around with. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's definitely um, definitely hard work um, in regards to you know, budgets and tour management, and so yeah, it's like trying to figure it all out. It's a lot of money, so um, I, there will be a time, I'm sure, that we play in the states with the horn section, um, which would be such a buzz i mean we could technically hire some session players over there there's nothing stopping us doing that either so um yeah I, i'd say maybe maybe that's a goal for 2025 <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah and then when uh you know lab7 comes out we'll, we'll chat yeah. about it and, and talk about the the horn section coming to the united states <laughs> yeah bro <Hard> <laughs> Uh, well, I'm I'm stoked to talk to you. Thank you so much again for doing this, Joel. I appreciate your time. I know, again, it's early there. 
Uh, I have one more question I want to ask. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Oh, for sure, man. Um, I guess my advice would be to to look after yourself as an artist. It's quite easy to, um, it's it's a tiring, a tiring uh, gig. You know, being a being a uh, being a performer, being a creative, it creates it. it it's like it's a lot of energy that you give out to people and give to your project and all that kind of stuff, right? So I think just being in check with yourself through that um, is super important for longevity in the industry uh, as an artist. Um, it's There's been times in my, you know, in, in my career that I've burnt out because I've, I've tried to do too much um, as an artist. So yeah, my advice would be just to look after yourself. Try, try and Try and treat it like a you know, an athlete would treat, um, you know, playing in a rugby team or playing, you know, at the, at the highest level. For me as a singer, it's super important for, to be healthy, to be able to continuously tour back-to-back -back shows and stuff like that. I've got to look after myself. So uh, it's something I'm constantly aware of um, and constantly working at. It's never, you know, I'm always refining things, you know. But um, that would be my advice, yeah. And then you'll last for a long time in the industry and you, you'll have a great career.